This is a download from Rutland Radio. Hello and thank you for downloading the Rutland Radio podcast from rutlandradio.co.uk. This is where you can hear the best bits from the last week. Well, I don't know whether you've heard there's something brand new happening at Barnsdale Lodge Hotel. In fact, there's a lot new happening. I'm here with Managing Director Ed Burrows. Now, you've looked at every menu and given that itself a facelift to, to some degree, but you've got this new gentleman's afternoon tea, which I've taken to that. We have, Rob. We're very excited about it. David Bukovicki, our exec chef, has been reviewing the menus. And one thing that he really wanted to look at was the whole afternoon tea offering. And um, he's, he's come up with this great gentleman's tea. So you still have the traditional afternoon tea, which is cakes, scones, sandwiches. How did you approach this one? David is a Yorkshireman, and he was saying that when he goes out for tea with his partner, that... She always has a lighter afternoon tea, and he, he wants something a bit heavier. And being a Yorkshireman, he thought, well, I'm going to create something that, that is. Hence the, the gentleman's tea. We, we, we thought it was a brilliant idea and something that was unusual and wasn't in Rutland. So let's do it and give it a go. So it's very much pockets of savoury from the steak sandwich to the, the black pudding pie. Yeah, it is. You've got a, a nice pint of bitter to, to wash it down. The homemade sausage rolls in the form of black pudding. You've always got to have a few chips. There's a few little skinny chips in there, and then something sweet at the end, which is the, is the chocolate Guinness mousse. So is this something exclusively for gentlemen? Well, do you know what? We've had so many ladies asking if they can have it as well, so it's for anyone to enjoy. Tell us what you're now doing moving forward with Barnsdale Lodge, because, you know, with the traditions around Rutland, you know, a place that's so near Rutland Water and so steeped in history, it's, you can't afford to stand still at the same time. You're right. The demand from visitors to the area is great, those on business. And what we've wanted to do at the hotel is have an accommodating menu that is served at different times of the day. And, I mean, one great thing we've come up with now is starting in April, we're having a tapas menu that runs from 12 till 6. And that means that when a lot of places close down, people will still be able to be looked after here and, and get something to eat. I never even knew that a gentleman's afternoon tea existed, but I, I enjoyed every single bit of that, from the Branston pickle to the ale to the black pudding to the steak sandwich to the chips. It all really does blend very well together. It's a very savoury way of looking at afternoon tea as well, isn't it? It is. And, you know, so many people now, they either can't make a lunch appointment or a dinner or special occasions, and they want to come out in the afternoon. And this is something that ticks that box and people can enjoy. Rutland Radio. Uh, now, Rutland Musical Theatre always head to Uppingham Theatre in April. And there have been a wide variety of productions over the years, from traditional Rogers and Hammerstein musicals. Some of them I've been involved with, been very proud to be part of the cast over the last few years. I'm not this time, but I tell you what, what a production this is going to be next Wednesday through to Saturday. Sweeney Todd, the demon barber of Fleet Street. Attend the tale of Sweeney Todd. Attend the tale of Sweeney Todd. Now, as you can hear from this, this is quite a departure from what Rutland Musical Theatre have done before. Director Tom Johnson is with me this morning. This is something you were really passionate about bringing to the stage, wasn't it, this particular one? It is, yes. Um, it's very, very, as you say, it's very different to what they've done before. Um, but I've always had a love for the musical. And when I saw the production in 2012 in the Adelphi Theatre in London, um, I just had a burning desire to do it. But I never thought RMT would be brave enough to do it um, because it is one that, most amateur groups shy away from um, because the the score is so complex and so intricate that a lot of a lot of amateur groups don't believe that they are able to pull it off um, we on the other hand are we we are going to pull it off yeah. and we are pulling it off and it's 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 going to be a great great show so can you summarize the tale of Sweeney Todd you know without giving the game away well, I mean, that's there's, the thing. there's blood and blood yes i can't give too much away um but basically it's about a, a barber who was exiled um, on a false charge all because Judge Turpin um, basically wanted to court his wife. He returns after 15 years of exile, um, goes into Mrs Lovett's pie shop to be told that his wife has drank poison and his daughter has been adopted by the judge. So in his anger he then wants to seek revenge. And through a series of events, they then go into business with one another. And that's where the famous part of the story comes into it, where Sweeney kills his victims and Mrs. Lovett makes them into meat pies. <laughs> that is just the most horrible image, yes. isn't it? I mean, you know, what sort of um, 
minimum age uh, is this? Because, you know, this is a thriller, isn't it? This yeah, is very it, different to the traditional musicals. It is. It's, it is a thriller. Um, there are lots of moments throughout it which are very funny. Um, there's something for everyone in it, but there are scenes of an adult content. Um, so usually on a production like this, the age, the age guidance is 12 plus. It's one of those things really the where you know you you take your child based on what you think they are able to watch and what they can cope with really but um generally we'd, we would say 12 onwards now, a lot of familiar faces on that stage come next wednesday tell us some of them yes so we've got um andy lee uh, locksmith from stanford he's returning as our lead uh, sweeney todd we've got a lot of new faces um elizabeth young who does a lot with sam's in stanford she's playing our mrs lovett um we've got martin muir who does a lot with the peterborough opera he's in the role of the judge um belinda graham and mick barker from oakham um, and then all the usual faces are in it as well. So, um, you know, there's lots of new and um, sort of more familiar faces. And how have you found this going solo on directing this? I know you had a team around you, but this was your your thing. And, you know, come next Wednesday, off yeah. it goes. Yeah, it's been a huge challenge. Um, <laughs> I've almost, almost as far as to say it's a full-time job, <laughs> um, but it's because you get so passionate about it that you want to give it all your time. But as you say, I have had a great team around me, um, and it's not always been easy because it is so difficult. But um, you know, this week, as we've started doing the full runs and putting it all together, I'm just really, really excited to get it in the theatre. With the we've got an incredible set, we're going to have an incredible orchestra, um, and when it all comes together next week the people of Rutland and surrounding areas are in for a treat really. £14 a ticket, 13 concessions. Uh, where can you get tickets from? I know there's a variety of different places. Yep, so you can get them online at wegottickets.com um, if you just search Rutland Musical Theatre. Uh, you can give Paula a ring. Um, if you go onto our Facebook page, Rutland Musical Theatre, all of the details are on there. Um, or you can go into Uppingham Sports and Books, Oakham Wines, um, and they're also selling them at the Orchard Cafe in uh, Uppingham at the Garden Centre. Attend the tale of Sweeney Todd next Wednesday through to Saturday. Evening performances at half seven and Saturday afternoon at half past two. Tom, it's been lovely to see you. I know it's, it's been ages <laughs> since I've seen you, actually. Yes, yes. We're usually sharing the stage together, Rob. Yeah, but I look forward to being in the audience and I hope you can go to Sweeney Todd next week, Wednesday through to Saturday at Uppingham Theatre. Highlights from the past seven days, the Rutland Radio podcast. So um, what's Oakham in Bloom getting up to on um, on the celebrations on Saturday? <laughs> <laughs> we're celebrating in our own way because we are unveiling a statue in the museum gardens that was donated to us by a very kind gentleman, i.e. the son of Roy and Joan Walton, who used to live at the uh, Hudson's Cottage. And this is a statue of Sir Geoffrey Hudson, the smallest man from the smallest county. And therefore, it was nice and proper that we should uh, cite it somewhere well, prominent, and we think the museum garden's a good place because there's a lot of protection there anyway. Tell me a bit more about Sir Geoffrey. OK. He was born circa 1619. It is thought he was not baked in a pie, but he was in a pie, and he was presented in the English court to Queen Henrietta Marie. He was the wife of Charles I, and he became her favourite. Uh, he was only 18 inches tall then, but uh, he had a, an exciting life. He had a duel with a courtier. And the, because he was so small, the courtier thought he wasn't big enough and strong enough to hold a gun. So he squirted him with water. But Sir Geoffrey had got a gun and shot him dead. And he was captured by Barbary pirates and spent 25 years in slavery in North Africa. But he did come back to England. He was ransomed and got back to England. And... Uh, he died in 1682, which makes him about 63 years old, doesn't it? And the school children from Brookhill Academy have presented some items to put in a time capsule, which we're placing under the statue. Oh, lovely. So that makes it even yeah, better, doesn't it? it does, yeah. Yeah. Rutland Radio. I'm Finn. I'm Rachel. I'm Georgia. Now, you're the Osprey Ambassadors at English Martyrs. What does that really mean? We watch and see what the Ospreys are doing at Rutland Water, and we report that to the school so they know what's happening. What's happening here today? Um, so we're Skyping West Africa, Spain and Italy and talking about our Ospreys and what they're doing in their countries. 
Are you worried about the language barrier? A little bit, but we think that hopefully they might be able to make out what we're saying. What do you know about the Ospreys so far this year then? About a week ago they've just flown back from Gambia and they've now nested and they're getting ready to lay some eggs. So they've come back to Rutland, or they've started to, haven't they? And you were at an event last week, is that right? Mm, yeah. Yeah, what was that? We went to a reserve and... We were looking at a PowerPoint on ospreys and looking at the nests and we actually got to watch some of the ospreys do things. How does it feel when you actually see them live there? Well, it feels quite special because obviously a lot of countries don't have the ospreys, so we're quite special to have them. Rutland Radio's best bids on the podcast. Ken Davis from the Rutland Osprey Project. I'm one of the education officers. And the team here actually not only spreading the message in Rutland but it is international isn't it, it? Is right it. around the migration route. That's absolutely right we're trying to um, contact as many schools as we can on the flyways between Rutland and West Africa so that, that takes in all the countries in Europe that the France, Spain and the African countries too of course going right down as far as Gambia where we've got a project with six local schools down there and we have as much interaction as we can throughout the year because remember that the ospreys are with them in Africa longer. They're, they're there seven months and only here for the five summer months with us. Now, obviously, the primary school children here particularly are fascinated by it. Is, is it the same bus, you know, over there? Well, we're hoping so. We've got lots of contacts in there now and we send a team down there every January when the ospreys are in that area and we get a really good reception from the Gambian schools just like we do here and they'll put on little plays and shows and so on based on the life of the osprey, which is a a real traveller, and it's great for them to learn about that. And the osprey is a great vehicle for international friendship and cooperation. Now, over the last fortnight, they started arriving back at Manton. Yep, absolutely. First one, I think, was uh, a couple of weeks ago now, and they've been coming steadily. And the latest count, as at today, March the 30th, is 13 ospreys including four pairs so that's a really good return and it's not even april yet and, and there'll be more to come and people can go and see them the linden center's yeah, been open L- for a couple of weeks linden's well. been open a couple of weeks now and the pair there are back maya and her mate osprey 33 they're really busy they're filling the nest with nice soft grasses and down and uh, getting ready for the laying of the first egg which we suggest could be in the next day or so so come and have a look yeah it's getting really exciting Rutland Radio we heard in the celebrations earlier uh, that uh, Phoebe Langston from Exton 21 today is doing a skydive at Sibson tomorrow all being well well, she's not the only one who's planning to jump out of a plane. Uh, morning to Dorothy Pridmore from Ketton. Now, um, w- would you mind, I-, I wouldn't normally ask a lady her age, but would you divulge that? Uh, yes, I will be 90 years old in May. And uh, how are you celebrating your 90th birthday? I'm going to do a parachute jump from Sibson Airfield. Wow. Uh, can, you, can you take in the magnitude? Uh, of that well i'm looking forward to it very much and people have been so responsive to me everybody has said good for you uh enjoy it and people will be there to watch me and uh i'm doing it for the charity alzheimer's my husband died of alzheimer's seven years ago and so i thought that would be lovely and people have been so generous in giving to the charity so i'm looking forward to it so you thought you'd call up rob Pisani on rutland radio and, and tell him about it so here yeah. we are live on the radio now so w- what are your feelings then as you uh, well you say you look you're looking forward to it just imagine that expanse as you go out presumably you're going to be tied to someone else yes yes it is uh, i do i do have someone um, yes it is I think they call it a piggyback or something like that. And uh, I'm thinking now that I'm going to fly like a bird and that will be lovely. Won't it just? What an amazing way to celebrate your your 90th birthday. And and how do you feel as you approach that generally? Well, I think when you... Life begins at 90 now, 
not 40, it begins at 90. And uh, you have to do something different and something daredevil, if you like. I mean, I've never, I've never been on radio before. That, that's far less scary than jumping out of plane for me. It really is. No, I think talking to you <laughs> and, is, is quite scary as well. Well, I hope I've, I've tried to kind of allay those fears this morning, Dorothy. Thank you very much for coming on Rotland Radio. We have, you have our full admiration. 6th of May at Sibson Airfield, yes. you'll, be, you'll be jumping out to celebrate your 90th. I will. Thank you very much indeed. This is Rutland Radio. First of all, Lord Porter of, uh, of Spalding. I mean, what an occasion today, and, and what an honour honor for you, actually. It's a fantastic honour to be able to do it, and obviously um, Rutland's a great county. Uh, I knew of Rutland before I had any interest in local government. Um, even before, when I moved into Peterborough, I'd lived there for a year and then moved into South Holland for a lot of years ago. I knew of Rutland again. When I earned an honest living, I was a bricklayer by trade, and I'm... I built a couple of extensions to properties in Rutland and I used to have the pleasure of being able to go fishing at Rutland Water occasionally. So it's got a great county, great place to live, quality of life's really good round here. Fantastic councillors, always have been. Um, I've worked with some really good ones. And today, to come for such a, a, an honourable occasion for myself and to bring a, the strangest gift I've ever taken to a party, to, to have a horseshoe made in, in my forge, in South Holland to bring over. It was a real pleasure and a real honour for me. And what a horseshoe it is. I think it's probably the most colourful that's, that's hanging up there at the moment. Um, With the, the floral crest on Yeah, well, the the tulips that are on the top of that represent them on my coat of arms. So the red one is for South Holland. It's, it's that kind of South Holland's emblem is a red tulip. And the pink ones were, I've got three of those on my coat of arms that were designed by my daughter. And you said in your speech that um, all Rutland obviously has, has returned 20 years ago, but, but that's not the end of it, possibly. Uh, or your fears, maybe. My fears and expectations are because we don't have a lot of money in the country at the moment. Government are looking to try to save money by bulking up councils. Uh, there are already four proposals on the table. Um, and I fear that Rutland, being such a small county, will probably be one of those that people look at in terms of scale. I know my own council, South Holland, which is larger than Rutland, but not a huge council by local government standards, we're already having conversations about what reorganisation looks like for us. And it's important that whatever that reorganisation is works for the communities that we look after reorganisation just can't be about an arbitrary number, it needs to be able to protect that sense of community and clearly Rutland is is bigger than just the number of people that live in it it is a place in the you know, 800 years of history I think Northamptonshire have tried to claim it Leicestershire have tried to claim it and it'll be hard today celebrating it still being independent so I think that needs to be taken into account whenever anybody looks at just drawing simple lines on a map. Rutland Radio. Here with Rutland's MP, Sir Alan Duncan, who's about to celebrate 25 years, actually, as our MP, and uh, very recently celebrated a, a milestone birthday, which we actually sang as part of the civic reception. You weren't expecting that, I imagine. No, that was a bit of a surprise. There are lots of anniversaries at the moment. There's um, 60 years for me, 25 years for being an MP, but I think most important of all... 20 years since we got Rutland back as a county. So this 1st of April is no April Fool. It's a special day for Rutland. And do you think actually looking back 20 years, it still actually works? You know, particularly in the the days of economies of scale where where things are merging all over the place. Now, economies of scale are often uh, a complete falsity. And I think the real unique advantage of Rutland is that it's small, sensitive to local needs, very responsive, and it doesn't have the waste of a big organisation. So some would say it's quite expensive, but actually I think it's very lean and efficient. And all councils have got monetary pressure. Rutland handles its pressures quite well. And, of course, we don't have equitable funding. We, we get far less than Leicester City, for instance. This is from the government compared to the council tax? Yes, that's right. So we don't get as much help from the centre as other counties do per capita. I mean, Leicestershire suffers the same difficulty in areas like education and that kind of thing. But Rutland does very well. I think we're well served by our councillors. And I think that, you know, if we were to be absorbed into Leicestershire or Lincolnshire, people would very quickly complain that, if you like, the services and things like that were unresponsive to local needs. So I think it's a good thing. I'm delighted that Rutland is Rutland. 
and I think this is a very happy day and I hope we have many years yet to celebrate Rutland as a county. Well, that's it for this week's Rutland Radio podcast. If you have any comments, you can email us via the website rutlandradio.co.uk and we'll have a new version on our website from Monday. This is a download from Rutland Radio. For more information, go to rutlandradio.co.uk. This is a download from Rutland Radio. Hello and thank you for downloading the Rutland Radio podcast from rutlandradio.co.uk. This is where you can hear the best bits from the last week. So the sun is shining here in Ketton. This is the the last time this event has happened, for this year anyway. What event is it? Um, Soup lunch. And how was it for you? Good, thank you. How come Ketton Primary School children get to come along and how do you get chosen? We put all our names in a hat. And we pick it out, and the lucky people who do it get to go on the radio and have lunch and soup. Yes, special bonus prize today of going on the radio as well. So um, tell us what you actually had today. I actually had bacon and lentil soup. What was the private supply that was on the table? I noticed there was a jug. Yeah, we had extra tomato soup. Excellent, fabulous stuff. So tell us what these lunches uh, are for, do you know? Uh, Yeah, it's to remember when Jesus spent 40 days in the desert, 40 days and 40 nights without any food. And do you know who actually raises money from this one? Isn't it the War Child? Yeah, and Evergreen Care Trust who look after people in Stamford as well. So what about some Easter holidays very soon? Has anyone got any exciting plans? We're going to see Boss Baby. Boss Baby? In the cinemas. It looks really good. Is that the film to see this Easter, would you say? Yes. I'm I'm going on holiday, and I think we're going to have Easter Day there. Fabulous. I'm going to Tembe in Wales with my cousins for a week, then hopefully going to see Boss Baby as well. Can I just get your first names just before we finish? Owen. Thomas. Jess. Izzy. Hugo. Thank you for joining us on Rutland Radio and, and happy half term when it get when you get there. Thank or happy you. end of term, should I say. Yeah. 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 Rutland Radio. I'm here with Christine Ockenden here at the Ketton St Mary's Congregational Hall. And the end of Lent lunches again so soon. Yes, we've completed our fifth week and we've had enormous support yet again. We've had lovely weather, only one wet day. And a lot of new helpers as well, which has been great. And the same staple of soup as ever, the same fundraising as ever. Yes, different soup makers and different people providing bread and fruit. But again, lots of support. And this year we've done it in aid of two charities, one local and one abroad. The Evergreen Care Trust, which is based in Stamford. And then a very worthwhile charity called War Child, which takes care of refugee children so that's extremely popular in in terms of support. You've been organising it for for some years? Yes I have actually organised it for 12 years but I have actually handed over now to somebody else which is wonderful but it's nice to still be a part of it and we've got a wonderful team of volunteers. It's a great legacy to leave isn't it because this is so established. Yes, I mean, the reason we keep doing it is because people keep coming. If they didn't come to support us, then obviously there wouldn't be a need, but there obviously is, and I think people like to come out and just have a chat and linger over lunch and enjoy a bowl of homemade soup. And a different day for the first time. Yes, we changed it because it coincided with the lunches which are run every month in the local Carver Court, and so we thought rather than clash with them on two Tuesdays, we would move it to Monday, but it's made no difference. Highlights from the past seven days, the Rutland Radio podcast. So what we've decided to do, well, we've been working on it for some years now, is to put an album together. It's kind of 50-50. It's half our own and half covers, which people seem to like. So that's what the whole new album is all about, basically. And I guess you record it very much like, you know, the rock and roll styles of the day. You know, you record it all live, do you? Uh, pretty much, yeah. pretty much. The music is first recorded live, and then if we want to put any overdubs on, yeah. like mm. an extra guitar part or yeah. vocals, are always put on afterwards. With yeah. what we do, we find it's better to do it that way to get the energy into it. You have to have that energy of us playing together 
for it to be like, you know. We kind of bounce off each other. We do, that's right. That's just the way we work. And you've got a gig to launch it at the Chord Exchange at the beginning of May, but you'd like people to download the album in advance, obviously, so they get used to it for the gig. And, you know, and and why not get it as quickly as you can? That's it. And also, it is being registered for the charts. So anybody who pre-orders it now, it will be as if they've bought it in the week of the release. We're trying to push ourselves the next step on the ladder. Yeah, and you can get it from uh, iTunes or Google Play or Amazon is the other one, yeah. And if you order it on iTunes before the release date, which is the 5th 5th of May, May. you'll get it for 4 99 On the actual gig, what we're doing in Stamford is actually the 6th of May. Obviously, you can buy a solid CD if you want, and that still gets counted for the charts. And also, we are looking into doing vinyl. We're doing a small run of vinyl, which is going to be limited edition. However, we have looked into it, and the waiting time for vinyl to come back to you is quite a long time. So tell us about the gig, then, on the 6th of May, as you say, at the Corn Exchange in Stanford. We're calling it the album launch gig, basically. So in the gig, we're going to be doing a lot more of our own material than what we would normally do at a standard gig, so people are going to get to see something different there. And, yeah, it's basically just us rocking it out at the Corn Exchange. A few new tricks. A few uh, new tricks. We've been working on, yeah. Oh, crikey. Just for that show. Yeah. Right, okay. <laughs> Sam well back. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Well, Ian, David and Robert Wilson, thanks very much for joining us today. The Hound Dogs, such You're a legendary welcome. band around here. And uh, that album is out to download now, and you can get it for four ninety nine in advance of the big gig night, which is at Stanford Corn Exchange on the 6th of May. Rutland Radio. I shall be celebrating this April the 40th anniversary of the paper I helped to found in April 1977, the Rutland Times, which is still going to my great, great pleasure. The Rutland Times, that obviously gave Rutland this sense of community because, you know, originally three sheep, four four sheets, um, and delivered to people's homes. It then became commercial. It's still got that kind of ethos. Do you see the Rutland Times in a way having given people almost a hope of a county in some way? No, I don't think that was it at all. I mean, there was, uh, back in 1977, it had happened three years earlier. No, it was a community newspaper. And uh, on the back of the previous year, when I'd done a creative writing course, I was asked if I'd like to be features editor. And that was very flattering. So I wrote for it for 12 years until I became a councillor when quite evidently doing 20 different things, I hadn't got any time. And it was about, well, just over four, maybe five years ago, I had a visit to the Stanford Mercury with the Melton people who wanted to digitise the Melton Times. And they said, would I like to go? And they unfortunately chose a driver who didn't know where the offices were, and they arrived 20 minutes late, which gave me a chance to talk to the editor and get a feel for what was happening. And I said, I think I'd like to write again. First of all, I wrote under a pseudonym, Margaret Gow, and the Gow stood for Grumpy Old Woman. And I said, I'll do that so nobody throws stones through my window if I say something they don't like. But on my 80th birthday, which was last year, I decided to come out of the closet, so to speak, and I've been writing every fortnight ever since and uh, enjoying it. Rutland Radio's best bids on the podcast. Can I have a chat to you for the radio? Oh, uh, yeah, sure. First back? Yeah. How was Thank that? Oh, uh, really good. It took a while, though, and you had to keep going. And what's your name? Uh, Joe Morton. Well done, Jerome. So are you pretty good at athletics generally? Yeah, I do a lot of running. And how training. is it with all the kind of winds on the on the? Oh, on it's the a airfield? lot tougher conditions. It's a bit easier on just the road. But on the airfield, you have to keep going. And tell us about the cause, Cancer Research UK. Does that mean something to you? A lot. My grandma died of cancer and I never got to meet her. So that's why I'm doing it. Thanks. Massive congratulations. Thank you. So I'm here with head teacher Mrs Thomas. Now, this is the first for you, um, only the second time I think there's ever been a school for Race for Life in Rutland. Oh gosh, I didn't realise it was the second week. Oh yes. <laughs> well, I'm glad really. It's something we decided to do. It was a member of staff who suggested it originally, um, whose husband is actually suffering from the disease at the moment, and we really wanted to get behind and support. Um, but since then it's grown and grown. So many people have said to us that they've been touched personally or their children we're supporting. So we felt it was the right thing to do. 
And how's the total going at the moment? I know we're aiming for 750. I'm absolutely staggered. We are so impressed. We have over 98 supporters and we've made £1,300 as we left the school building. And I've got a feeling that total is going to be growing here as well today. That's an amazing end of term, isn't it, really? It is. It's a really nice way of celebrating everything the children do. We teach them about the core values. One of those is compassion. And this is such a great way for the children to actually show compassion for others, whether or not they've been affected. But it's knowing that actually when things happen, that are sad things within a family, there's a way you can help. And research with Cancer Research UK is so important. And obviously you've got the support of the military here today as well. I mean, doing the warm-ups, who was involved? We've been really lucky. Um, it started off as a little, can I use some of the space, please? Um, and it's now fully supported by both uh, the uh, poachers and the Seven Reg. We are just staggered. And this is where the community are exceptional. This is why I work on an army base and why I wouldn't work anywhere else. Because actually, when you do things like this, you realise how amazing they are as a group to come together to put this on in their own time this afternoon to support their children and for the whole community. Uh, Lance Corporal, Jack Holsey. I mean, what a special event today. Yeah, it's lovely. It's great to see participation in the community, uh, both regiments on camp coming together. So um, just looking at the, uh, the back of us there, we're obviously on the airfield and the children are still coming in, but there's an awful lot of uh, PT going on over there. Yeah, what we've got here are some lovely volunteers who've chosen not to participate in the fun run but however, choose to do some more military-based fitness. Uh, a gentle beast in on a nice sunny day today. And how was it actually leading all the children in the school in a warm-up early? Yeah, it's really fun. It's nice to engage. We try and incorporate new warm-ups into our training. Uh, so to use it with the kids as well, it's funny. A really good reaction with them as well. Well, that's it for this week's Rutland Radio podcast. If you have any comments, you can email us via the website, rutlandradio.co.uk, and we'll have a new version on our website from Monday. This is a download from Rutland Radio. For more information, go to rutlandradio.co.uk. This is a download from Rutland Radio. Hello, and thank you for downloading the Rutland Radio podcast from rutlandradio.co.uk. This is where you can hear the best bits from the last week. I'm uh, Adam Lowe, and I'm the chairman of Oakham Town Council. Now, the uh, Oakham Town Plan, obviously, is all about the, the future um, of Oakham. People have the questionnaire at the moment. Uh, they can also complete the survey online. Um, I, I really, you know, really like to be able to you know, inspire people to do that, because the more people that do it, the better. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. And, and the thing is, it is the people's plan. It gives the people of Oakham and Barleythorpe an opportunity to uh, develop the community they live in over the coming years. So what they put in now will impact what comes out in the future. Uh, I've completed the survey because I've been working in Oakham now for 18 odd years. You know, there's all kinds of things in there from, you know, should the high street be pedestrianised? Should there be a distinct break between Oakham and Barleythorpe? Where should the new houses go? Where should any new industry go? It's, it's all in there and it only takes 10 minutes to actually state your views, doesn't it? Absolutely, yeah. And there are other partnerships behind the scenes. Rutland County Council are working on town centre management. There's a new Barleythorpe Parish Council being formed. And then, of course, this steering group, which is trying to help bring all that together. And yeah, a quick survey, pretty straightforward questions. So people put their information down, put their views across, and it all helps go into the big pot that will develop something which will be a local but unique uh, to Oakham and Barleythorpe plan. Now, it's all going to move quite quickly from now, isn't it? Yeah, we want the forms back ideally by April the 14th. That's when the steering group have asked for them. They will be going out to a third party to help collate the information. So the analysis will be done after the surveys are returned. So if you have the survey at home, you can complete it that way. You can also complete it online as well. But it's really just to inspire people to do that, isn't it? Absolutely. And it's not the end either, because once they've got all the surveys back, the steering group will actually write a draft plan that will come out of the results of what you tell them now. And there'll be opportunities in the future for people to actually come back as well and give further input as time develops. So, yeah, get it in by the 14th of April. And then hopefully by the end of April, there should be some feedback coming from the steering group. That's the Oakham and Barleythorpe neighbourhood plan. If you live in Oakham or you work in Oakham or Barleythorpe, Oakham and Barleythorpe together, this is all about, then please do take 10 minutes to have your say. And Adam Lowe, Chairman of Oakham Town Council, thanks for joining us on Rutland Radio. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Highlights from the past seven days, the Rutland Radio podcast. My name's Gordon Pearson. I'm part run ambassador for um, Cambridgeshire and Rutland. OK, and um, what's the meeting all about tonight? Um, tonight we're meeting so that we can form a core team for the new 
junior park run at Rutland Water, which will be at nine o'clock on a Sunday morning every week. So we're looking for keen, enthusiastic people to fill a number of key roles, event director, run directors, and anybody else that's interested in being part of uh, something that will be great for the area, for kids between 4 and 14. So when will the junior park run start? I haven't really got an idea at the moment because we need to make sure that we've got people to get it up and running. But generally we can get something up and running probably within two months if everything comes into place. The volunteers, funding, of course, there's a lot of work to do for the new team. But we could potentially get it running within the next couple of months. So you're looking for volunteers and what would the volunteers be doing? There'll be a a number of roles. So there's the main person that looks after the event, so the event director. So they're overall responsible for everything. Then you would have a, a run director who's responsible for the event on the morning. And then you would have all the other roles that go with a normal running event. So timekeeper, funnel manager, marshals on the course and also people that do the specific part run roles which are barcode scanning and sorting tokens it's all very easy very simple people can learn it in a couple of minutes is the park run a yearly thing or is it seasonal the junior park run will be nine o'clock every sunday morning at rutland water at normanton there is the opportunity to have extra ones at christmas and new year Uh, but yeah the, the expectation is that it will be every sunday morning going forwards the weekly Rutland Radio podcast. It's Rutland Radio at breakfast time. I'm Rob Pisani. I have with me nearly half of the Rutland first responders, Barbara Crellin, Juliet Burgess-Ray and uh, Jackie Lawrence. Thank you very much for, for joining us today. Um, are you often the, the first port of call then for actually calling out to uh, medical emergencies? Is that how it works? What happens if um, somebody makes a 999 call, the control room will look at the nearest medical responders around. It may be a paramedic, it may be the EMAX doctors, or it could be ourselves. So often because we're in the villages and the ambulance may be stationed in, say, Leicester, they could be a good 45 minutes away. So we will go and check the casualty. We cannot leave and we will wait with that casualty until... We're backed up by a paramedic or one of the EMIX doctors. Now, Julia, I said I've got nearly half of the Rotterdam First Responders with us. People have probably worked out there's three people. You've got eight in total. Do you need more people, actually, to cover the county? Always. The more the merrier, really, when it comes to saving a life. And you, you've said to me before, uh, you cover 12-hour shifts. Is that basically just, you know, you can't go anywhere, put your phone on, and then people will just call you and you rush out? Does it work like that? No, basically we log on at our convenience really as much as we can and we try to do a minimum of four hours up to 12 hours. In fact, Kevin has been known to do almost 24 hours at times and basically it's our convenience when we're available, we log on and we respond as quickly as we can and as Jackie said, being in the village, being in Oakham, we can get there much faster than a lot of resources. Do you have to go through a huge long training course? I mean, you must be at the very least first aid trained. No, actually, it's not first aid training. They'll tell you when you go that if you're a first aid or a first aid trainer, that doesn't matter. It is different because it isn't basic first aid we're doing. Juliet has just done her basic training, which... Juliet? Hi, yeah, I've just completed um, a three-day course at Kendry Barracks. It's really full-on. It was really interesting. We were doing scenarios with dummies and things like that, and also we covered things like choking and bleeding and using a defibrillator. Yeah, so Juliet's a level two. We have four level three responders and very soon level fours coming on board so as we go up the levels we deal with increasingly complex and difficult cases. Now people see say the emix doctors going out you know they have the logoed car and everything do you have like a light on the top or anything like that would people know that you're on the way to an emergency? Unfortunately not we would love to have a car The poachers, which are the responders from the barracks, they have one, but we use our own vehicles. We do have little signs in the back of the cars to say we're a first responder. We've got our own uniform that we wear, but our first response when we meet the person at the other end is to tell them who we are, introduce ourselves and tell them we are first responders, but also that an ambulance is on its way backing us up.
Can I just make mm. one plea to the public? When we get these calls, and particularly in the evening, the one thing we spend a lot of time of is trying to find the house, the number, the name of the house. And I know you have spoken about it before, but we can't iterate it enough that if you've made that call and you don't have a clear number, please can you put something outside or have your car headlights or just have somebody outside waving just so we know because if I Vital minutes can be lost if we can't find that house, particularly if it's down an alleyway. Even if it's a dustbin with your number on the dustbin, you know, at least we can work out where you are. Marvellous. Well, thank you very much for coming in today, the Rutland First Responders. And uh, yeah, if people would like to join you, they can look you up on social media and obviously have a chat to you if they see you around. So you've all got these maroon polo shirts on, which is a good way of knowing who's who. Except we are in the process of changing over to blue. Are you? Yeah. Well, there you go. They're getting worn out, so we're getting a new set. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's good to know you're doing such hard work. Thanks for coming into Rutland Radio. Thanks, Rob. Thank Thanks, you. Rob. Well, that's it for this week's Rutland Radio podcast. If you have any comments, you can email us via the website, rutlandradio.co.uk, and we'll have a new version on our website from Monday. This is a download from Rutland Radio. For more information, go to rutlandradio.co.uk. This is a download from Rutland Radio. Hello and thank you for downloading the Rutland Radio podcast from rutlandradio.co.uk. This is where you can hear the best bits from the last week. Thank you very much, David. Well, it's a wonderfully sunny 13th uh, Rutland to Melton cycle classic. I'm here with organiser Colin Clues. Is, is weather like this great for spectators? Does it actually make the competition finer in terms of you haven't got the, the rainy challenges we've had in the past? Well, there, there are obviously some riders that prefer the rain, uh, Rob, but uh, I think that, yeah, it's, it makes people more enthusiastic. You know, like anything, with a little bit of sunshine on your back, it, it uh, turns on the heat, doesn't it? And, uh, and people are, are really up for this race today, and I think that we're going to see some absolutely excellent racing, and uh, probably the more so with the conditions that we have. It's great. Now, it all starts uh, here in Oakham Marketplace at 11 o'clock this morning. Now, it's two circuits of Rutland Water coming, shuttling back through here just right. after 12. Mm-hmm. Um, we can hear the church bells mm-hmm. in the background. It's, it's like a proper festival, isn't it? This is kind of what you always believed it should be. Yes, that, that's right, both for Oakham and for Melton, you know, and it's nice that the towns have taken the race to its, to its heart, really. And um, really, yeah, it's, it should be seen as a community event, you know, because this is a bike race that is making, you know, uh, a really name for the area and uh, we hope that uh, you know people are going to be proud of the racing you know, now and in years to come certainly mm. now this is an international event isn't it you've got people as far as actually from, from africa this year yes 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 a guy from eritrea we've also got an ecuadorian we've got a brazilian you know it, there are 21 nations represented here today of the various teams and there are 38 teams that in itself is a record for us which uh, is incredible and, and uh, it it all adds to the spectacle yeah. now you've redesigned the course um, this year that, towards Stafford park yeah, well, we, we have two redesigns, one that actually happens in Rutland, and uh, anyone that knows the Barleythorpe area will know the Manor Lane, which uh, is, is a very rough and a very uphill route. Well, uh, uh, I think today we're going to give the riders a little bit of a shock because they've normally gone scooting up the A606 after coming through the town. Well, this time we're going to divert them straight up Manor Lane. We've, we've entitled it Barleyburg to keep in the character of the race. And uh, we'll wait and see what comes out of the top of there to start with. But then, you're right, we have uh, also added in, uh, uh, towards the finish, two, two laps through uh, Stapleford Park. Now, they've, they've actually hosted golf tournaments in the past, international golf tournaments, but this is the first time that they've ever had a big bike race go through there, and we're really proud that they've come on board with us, and we're really uh, appreciative of the uh, Stapleford Estate for allowing us to do it. Yeah. So if people come down here, we've got all the race programmes, people can find out the exact route. It is worth planning, isn't it? You know, the... It may be, you know, you may not know that your neighbour's going to this, but there may be someone from miles away Mm. and tons of people, you know, the the world comes here, don't they? They do, they do. You know, we have people that travel to Britain each year to watch this from the continent, you know, uh, outside of the teams and and from all parts of the countryside to come and uh, see what's happening here. And, uh, you know, we're really, really proud that that's happening. And, yeah, there's, there's something for every, everyone. And uh, it's, it's a race which is spectator-friendly. You know, if you w- 
what you want to see a race once and it whizzed by like in the Tour de France, well you can do that. You can come here and you can see the race in perhaps 12 places, 12 different places. And of course, if you go out to Ouston, you can see it six by standing in the same place. Yeah. Organiser Colin, please, thanks very much for joining us today. It's yeah. lovely to be here, yeah. part of this yeah. again. Well, you're welcome. Any time, Rob. Thank you very much. Rutland Radio. Thank you, David. We're here in the marketplace. The stage is actually set back slightly from where it is. The sign-ons continue. I'm here uh, with race commentator Hugh Porter, who you will know if you ever watch cycling on the TV, you're, you're the man. Oh, that's very kind of you. Very flattering. Thank you very it's much true, for though, the honour. Yeah. And, of course, you know, on the TV last year, you know, you did the, the commentary when, when this race was televised. Yes, I did the voiceover. It was uh, the first time, actually, we've managed to get it onto the television. It's in entirety. Uh, there was a very professional edit done, unfortunately, uh, Colin asked me to go down and do the voiceover, which I thoroughly enjoyed. And uh, it was good to let the race be broadcast to people apart from the people that follow it immediately. So, yes. And from what I hear, it went out uh, all over the world and it's still getting feedback to this day. Now, um, tell us how this event fits into the cycling calendar because, you know, for, for people in this tiny little county, uh, this is, you know, the cycle race. Some people even call it a ride, but it's by no means a ride, isn't it? Well, I suppose you are riding. Well, I know, but, you know, in terms of the, the competition, is fierce. Yeah, it is fierce. I mean, you are riding, except that yesterday was a sportive. All those people were loving riding the bike round Rutland Water. Here, the people are riding, and the optimum aim, of course, is to win an event that's being run off at something around about 25, 26 miles an hour. And uh, there are, uh, I think it's 11 off-road sections. There's been two sections added this year, so it's going to be even more demanding, and the finishing circuit is slightly bigger as well. But where does it fit in the community? I think it's... It is now sort of part of uh, the year of Oakham and Rutland and the immediate area. People think, oh, it's the big race, we've got to watch that. And they flock out there to watch it. And I mean, I uh, leave after the start here, I go direct to uh, Ouston, and um, uh, Dick Harvey looks after me down there. We get a massive crowd, and the atmosphere is phenomenal. So it's a, it's a, it's a thing that's captured the imagination. Of, of families as well because you get people rocking up with their kids and everything they all love it and they all join in the atmosphere no it, it's definitely part of the year's activities in the area and, and what what is, is the biggest thrill for you for, for me it's when the, the peloton comes rattling through again just after 12 it's just amazing i think the biggest thrill for me is being given the honor to describe the event um, it's a bit like i always refer to it in commentaries a lot of people have comment uh, have cop I've captured this, but I'd like to put my hand up and feel that I was the one that thought of it originally. It's like, it's chess on wheels, basically. Somebody makes a move, a team looks at the strength of that move and defends that man or men, and then it's countered by moves from other teams. And it really is intriguing because you never know what the final outcome is going to be. So it's something that I enjoy describing. It's not something that's tedious, that's happening all the time. It's changing all the time. So it's a sport that I've done... Well, since I was knee-high to a grasshopper, and I'm still quite enthusiastic about it. In fact, I'll change that. I'm still very much enthusiastic about it. And we're delighted to have you here in Oakham again, Hugh Porter. Thanks for joining us on Rotherham Radio. Can I just put in over that? You can. Right. Is it amazing? Apart from one year that I can remember in 2012, when I thought the end of the world had arrived, the sun always shines here. Mostly. (laughs) Mostly, yes. We've been looking at the property, my wife and I, but I think it's just out of reach for us. Oh, well. We'll try and reduce it a bit for you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. I'm here with Kay Drake, Vice Chair of uh, Riding for the Disabled, based in Summerby. Uh, lovely to have you represented in the Cycle Classic today and see all the riders dressed in their orange there. It's absolutely marvellous, and it's lovely that we've actually got the East Midlands riding with our logo on their shirts, um, which have been kindly donated, as usual. Everything comes through donations, and it's just wonderful to see so many people out to support us. Tell us about Riding for the Disabled at, at Summerby. I mean, it's, it's one of those sort of organisations I suppose people are aware of, they've heard of, but maybe unless they're directly involved, they don't necessarily know what you're up to. That's true. We ride approximately 40 adults and children from various schools. During the week, we ride uh, approximately 36 to 40 weeks a year as well. Come rain or shine, we're out there. And we have people of all varying disabilities. We have children who have autistic needs, we have people in wheelchairs, we have people who've had strokes. We have a varying amount of people who come. And we have six sessions a week with many, many volunteers helping around. And everybody gets so much from it, particularly some of the children with very little core strength. They get a lot of core strength from actually riding the animals. 
and a lot of the children who barely speak to other people will actually interact with the animals and the horses are just so brilliant they always know when they've got somebody disabled on board. For those actually just approaching this from the outside they must think that it's almost impossible for some of the people actually you get riding to ride because as you say because of their core strength because of the way their muscles and, and, and you know that their bones are. It really is amazing and what we normally have for people like that we have one person to lead the horse and we have two what we call sidewalkers who are there to assist them in their being able to stay in the saddle but it's amazing how quickly they actually learn to be able to sit in the saddle and how quickly they do progress and as I say the horses just seem to know and they're very gentle with them they don't do anything that they might do with a more abled rider they don't go quickly they go nice and slowly for these riders and we take it very slowly and easily for them and finally what does it mean actually to be the partner of this major cycling event here in Rutland oh it's, it's just such a huge support it really is we do struggle we need to raise about £30,000 a year just to keep going and to have the cycle race behind us and to have them supporting us is a massive thing it really is and if anybody ever wanted to volunteer please come and find us we're on facebook you can put in the mount group riding for the disabled we would love anybody to volunteer fundraise do anything Okay, thank you very much for joining us here in Oakham Marketplace. Thank you. Rutland Radio. Thank you very much, David. Uh, We're here with the uh, Riding for the Disabled um, team who are here today, or at least that's that's what you're supporting. I think it's the first time the RDA actually have been represented in the cycle class. Uh, I think it's the first time they've been represented in the cycle class here today, yeah. So a good thing to support, and it's good to have on the jersey to race with. Not Ollie under there, is it? Yeah, it's Ollie, yeah, yeah. So Ollie, is, yeah. is this your first time in the actual big race then? Or was it's, that my, last... it's my third time doing it, so a uh, local rat lad from Oakham. So, yeah, third time doing it this year. Uh, bad luck last year. The year before was 17th, so hopefully better this year. And yeah, it should be good. So tell us about the team. You've got Rutland Cycling and Giant, who obviously are sponsoring quite a lot of the event this year. Uh, yeah, loads of uh, local sponsors, loads of sponsors on the jersey, so uh, good for us to be able to ride the event, you know, with no team card, no support here. So Colin Clue's given us a chance to ride for the regional team, which is East Midlands, which is great. Excellent. So how's your season been so far? It's been all right. I had a couple of crashes and a bit of bad luck in the Premier Calendar races. Uh, I was 22nd last week in Chorley, so hopefully the form's uh, better than last year, definitely. So hopefully I can do something today. Sure. People often say that the sun often shines at the Cycle Classic. It's not always the case. But is it actually tougher to kind of edge ahead in the, in the sunshine? Or, you know, when you think of like the tougher stages, when the rain's pelting down, it gets really muddy, that really sorts out the field. Is, is the sunshine kind of tougher? Yeah, definitely sunshine's better here than the rain, just because of the sectors and the mud and the grit and stuff, you know. Especially adding this new sector in at uh, Stafford Park's not great. Uh, you know, if it rained, it'd be you know treacherous for everyone. So um, yeah, thankful it's not raining. To be honest, you know there wouldn't be a lot of finishes if it was. There won't be a lot of finishes today anyway. But the rain would, you know, there'd probably be about ten finishes, I should think. So yeah, the sun's definitely better. And Ollie Maxwell, tell us what it means actually to ride your your local event like this. Oh, it's wicked. You know, I mean, watching this for ages and. Um, you know, to ride it and uh, to be competitive in 2015 with the you know the big guys and stuff. So hopefully today I can be the same. But you know local roads, I know everything about the race. So uh, yeah, it's great. I really enjoy it. Look forward to it every year. More nervous in the races, but yeah, it's wicked. Thanks very much for joining us on Rutland Radio. Cheers, thank you. Highlights from the past seven days: the Rutland Radio podcast. Well, it's everything we hoped for, and it's everything the people that the film's about deserve, and it's everything that the people of Rutland deserve. Because without the people of Rutland, we would never have got it made, and the cooperation and collaboration we had was fantastic. I am proud of what we've achieved because it's exactly as we set out to do it a Rutland film set in Rutland about Rutland people and with the collaboration and cooperation of the county so yeah absolutely it happened exactly on the turn of the millennium so December 1999 and then the real impact advanced over the following weeks and I went into a coma mid-December and woke up again in March, April uh, the following year. And when I woke up, it was really, really odd in that the millennium had passed and I'd got this radical change to my body with having my arms and legs amputated and all of my face at the time was gone. And Nick had been eight months pregnant at the time that I got ill. So Freddie, our son, was born in January whilst I was in the coma. So she presented me with this (laughs) brand new baby boy as well. So everything was 
a bit spaced out when I came to. There's obviously that nerves that you're like portraying a real person and you're mimicking a certain way that they walk and move and you don't want to be disrespectful at any point, you don't want to cause any upset and of course you're going through such personal moments in their life that you don't want to cause emotional upheaval for them. So yeah, it was a lot of pressure but at the same time having them there, having their blessing meant a huge amount. But ultimately this script, Bill's script and Tom and Nick's story just struck the most incredible chord with me and I just felt it was a story that has to be told and it was the most amazing love story I'd ever read in my life and it's true. I just felt so passionate that people needed to know what they'd been through and know what an amazing inspirational couple they are and thank goodness so far so good people seem to be really taking that from the film as well which is exactly what I took from the script. We could not have made this film without the support of Rutland and that is absolutely true. We actually ended up making the film, I won't go into into budget details, but we did end up making the film on half the budget that we originally wanted to, which would still be a, you know, a low-budget independent film. And there was a point I wobbled and went, how can we make this film you know, on this amount of money? Are we really going to try for this? But what I had underestimated at that point was the support, and what I hadn't experienced was the support that we had from the local community. Tom and Nick are from Rutland. It's a Rutland story. It's their story. And my goodness, the community went above and beyond to give us locations, to help us with costumes to I mean literally you name it we had help and we wouldn't have been able to do it without them Rutland Radio's best bids on the podcast Terry Eaton here at Stanford Arts Centre I can't believe this is the first time actually I've seen your whole talk we've, we've spoken so many times we've spoken when you've been on the ocean when you've been miles away f- from home and, and I guess every time you do this talk it must be different in some way but it's it's all about people and animals and life isn't it i think so i think that's sort of what the journey was like and it feels as though when i give a talk you're just trying to give a flavor of it a sense of it and hopefully leave people with the idea that maybe they can head off on whatever it is they might like to do as well and being so well known locally did you ever feel any kind of pressure or expectation that that people were kind of going come on Sarah come on you've got to do it you've got to do it as opposed to actually willing you on I just felt a lot of support and a lot of love from people all over and and especially locally and I think mostly people just want you to be safe I mean that's the overriding sense so no I never I don't think I ever did feel pressure in a in a negative way I certainly felt pressure in terms of responsibility but uh, no I just felt positive support and I'm really grateful for that. Where do you go back to when actually you're on the stage and you're reliving all this? Are you actually back in the moment? At times I'm very much back in the moment. I think for me that feels like the most authentic way to give a sense of the journey is to try and get back there which at times is quite emotional. At other times I feel very much in the room and you know just playing up to the audience and enjoying the energy that's coming back as well. But uh, It's been a wonderful night here. And you're going to continue doing talks around the country and around the world. What are your other plans? My book, Dare to Do, published in November. And we're going to make a film of the journey next year. And I want to write a children's adventure book as well. Uh, Separately to that, besides just enjoying being at home and seeing friends and family and things, uh, one day I'd like to set up a couple of different projects where we get children outside, young people outside. Firstly, by taking camping into schools and in another way, getting youngsters out onto the farm and doing sort of outdoorsy, wonderful things. Sarah Eaton, lovely to see you. Thanks for joining us on Rutland Radio yet again. Happy days. Thank you, Rob. The weekly Rutland Radio podcast. It's Rutland Radio at breakfast time. I'm Rob Pisani. Delighted to welcome uh, this year and part of next year's High Sheriff of Rutland, Craig Mitchell. Craig, thank you very much for joining us. Now, how do you become a High Sheriff? Because this is a long process, isn't it? Long before you actually start your year. It is. You're absolutely right, Rob. It, it was, I think, three and a half years ago I was approached. It's not something you write in for and, and put your name up for. Someone will tap you on your shoulder one day and say... How would you like to do the job? And that happened to me. I was really surprised by it all. It hadn't occurred to me in the slightest. And it all arose at a time when I was thinking about retirement, and so it fitted in. And I took a snap decision in exactly three weeks to make up my mind and say yes. And so there we are. 
So how do you personally see the role? Because each of the high sheriffs that we've had approaches it slightly differently. It is very much up to the individual to do what he or she wants to do. It's a charitable year. You have connections with local charities. That is very much the idea of it. You're the Queen's representative on matters of law and order in the county. That sounds very grand. It doesn't mean that police officers and traffic wardens pay any attention to me. But um, I do get around and I see them and I go to events and it's it's flying the flag for the county and, and for Her Majesty as well, of course. So tell us about the charities that you're waving the flag for this year. Well, I'm supporting three charities this year. The first one is Warning Zone, which is... I think now a very well-known charity in the East Midlands. It's based in Leicester. It's aimed at uh, highlighting to school children aged 10 and 11 the dangers of life. I'm supporting also Air Ambulance. I think that's a fantastic charity. I've never quite understood why lifeboats and Air Ambulance don't have government financial support, but they don't, and they do a fantastic job. Out here, we know we have the A1, we have the A47, we have an agricultural community as well, and uh, people do need the Air Ambulance fairly regularly. A&E hospitals are not on the doorstep, unfortunately. My third charity, Dove Cottage Hospice, is fairly new to Rutland. It's based just up in the Vale of Beaver at Stavon. It is a day centre hospice, not residential, but they recently opened uh, a small day centre at Ridlington. Two days a week they're running, and uh, my wife and I have a real interest in the hospice movement, and we think it's a great thing for Rutland. So we want to support that as well. So you've already got a calendar of uh, various different signposts just to actually um, help raise um, s- some money for the, for those three. Something that happened for the very first time last year is happening again, I'm pleased to say. What a spectacle it was last year, the hue and cry. Yeah, Sarah Furness, the immediate past High Sheriff of Rutland, organised the first hue and cry in Oakham, probably for several centuries, I should think. It's one of those historical things that a High Sheriff is able to do to raise a hue and cry. It used to be in pursuit of a criminal. These days, we close off the high street in Oakham and um, people run up and down the street and we chase a criminal dressed in a criminal's uniform, if there's such a thing, and um, raise some money and have a lot of fun. And it'll be three or four hours of hijinks and what have you on the 29th of May, the May Bank Holiday Monday. So that's the next bank holiday after this forthcoming Monday, uh, the first Monday in in May, of course, May Day. Greg Mitchell, the new High Sheriff of Rutland. Well, welcome to the role and and welcome to your first chat on Rutland Radio, no doubt of many in your year. Thank you, Rob. Thank you very much. Rutland Radio. A space, a stage on Stamford's sunny streets where many voices soon will echo through the passing years of how the blacksmith has the anvil but the wordsmith has this stone. Using words to break you, to chip and chisel and shake you, I forsake you. I travel on alone, trying to find an answer. The walls, churches, bricks of the buildings, the grasses, the meadows, the animals shall hear the people's words, their mysteries, struggles and strengths upon this stone. Pipe up, perform your peace, stand proud. Project, protest, proclaim and shout. Step up and speak your truth out loud. Let words fly free, let verse burst out. Evenings shorten and bonfires burn. Ladies in the cosy club before their return from the early Christmas shopping in Sheep Market would have come in the car but couldn't park it. (laughs) Stamford wraps up, preparing for winter cold. Wellies and winter coats are now starting to be sold. No matter what the season, Stamford is the place to live. What other town in England has quite so much to give? Thank you. Well, that's it for this week's Rutland Radio podcast. If you have any comments, you can email us via the website, rutlandradio.co.uk, and we'll have a new version on our website from Monday. This is a download from Rutland Radio. For more information, go to rutlandradio.co.uk.